Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm going to be sharing an intervention that we've developed today, um, looking at trying to find the right amount of information for pregnant women and their providers in deciding to immunise during pregnancy. Because anybody who has either been pregnant or been around somebody who is pregnant will know that it is one of the times in life when you are bombarded with healthcare information and health healthcare expectation. And many women talk about an information overload. And I'd just like to acknowledge my co-author, Julie Leesk. So a little bit of background in antenatal care in Australia. If a lady falls pregnant, there are a number of antenatal care options open to her. And the three most common are hospital antenatal clinic. So she goes to her local hospital, there's an antenatal clinic there, and she has her antenatal visits with a midwife and also sees an obstetrician. In terms of vaccines, it's very site specific. Vaccines aren't always available on site at these uh, hospitals and uh, more and more of them as time progresses are having them on site, but it's not always. Um, she can also visit her general practitioner and have her antenatal care through her general practitioner um, and attend the hospital for only certain visits throughout the pregnancy. The difference here is that all of the pregnancy vaccines are available at all GPs free of charge. Uh, another um, mode of antenatal care that's available is the birth centre, uh, which is generally midwife led. It is for low risk pregnancies and it's generally for women who don't want quite as much intervention in their pregnancies. Um, vaccines, again, aren't available at all of these birth centres. Um, and if you can't get a vaccine at a birth centre or the antenatal clinic, the woman has to then go and make a separate appointment to her GP to get the vaccine. So a couple of years ago, we did a study uh, called the MumVax study. It was a mixed method study where we did a quantitative survey of 815 women and we did a qualitative uh, interviews with 20 uh, women looking at women's uh, information needs around immunisation during pregnancy, their decision making processes, um, disease risk and uh, perception and vaccine risk perception. And we sampled from three demographically diverse sites, both in uh, the inner city, uh, outer urban and in rural New South Wales. And the women that we sampled were from across all three of these antenatal care models. So what did we find? The healthcare provider is the most important part of their decision making. And that's in line with a, a lot of other studies from around the world. So. Statistically speaking, in our sample, women who'd had a recommendation to have a flu vaccine were 20 times more likely to have had that vaccine than women who hadn't had their recommendation. So that got us thinking about, well, what about the healthcare providers? Are they recommending it? So I uh, got involved with a, another study of general practitioners in the Sydney area, and we found that the GPs themselves weren't actually confident about their knowledge and felt they needed more information to confidently recommend vaccines to their pregnant patients. In terms of disease risk perception, the, almost all of the uh, women framed their responses in terms of risk to the baby. It was never about them, it was all about the baby. Um, so therefore they saw influenza as predominantly a disease of the mum and whooping cough as a disease of the baby and therefore comparatively more severe. Um, and this is just a, a, a a quote from, from one of the ladies in, in the study. So basically she was saying that she was more worried about the trauma that she was going to spend, the energy she would spend fighting off a flu infection that could be given to the baby. She, she really wasn't worried about the effect on her. So we looked at their information seeking behaviour, we looked at their vaccination behaviour and we looked at how they interacted with their healthcare providers and we came up with a bit of a spectrum of, of vaccine behaviours and there were three broad groups that we called quiescent, reactive and proactive. So quiescent women were the ones that took information um, almost passively, they didn't actively go out and seek any information themselves, they took up the vaccine without question. And they use their healthcare providers both as sources of information, but also for prioritisation. They were expecting their healthcare provider to tell them what to do. We then had the reactive group of women. Now, the example I have here is a, is a lady who uh, was pregnant and somebody at work had whooping cough, and that was what prompted her to go out and find more information about vaccine and what she should be doing. So these women only sought informa information if they were prompted to do so. 
They took up the vaccine opportunistically based on a perceived need, but also on availability. So going back to the antenatal care models that I mentioned earlier, if they were at a site where there was no vaccine available, they might not have been um, uh, prompted to take it up. They used their healthcare providers for information and direction still, but not quite as heavily as the quiescent group of women. Finally, we had the proactive women. Now, these were the ladies who had gone out and proactively sought information on Im immunisation and what was re required. They were across the subject. They actively uh, either accepted or refused the vaccine. And I've got two examples there. Um, the one on the bottom, the lady had actually, the, her GP had recommended it and she had thought about it, done her research and decided not to. These women, they still use their healthcare provider as part of their immunisation decision making, but the way they used it was very different. These women used their healthcare provider as a sounding board, but ultimately made their own decision. So as you can see, there is quite a range of information needs here. So you quiescent women were more likely to say, information overload, I, just tell me what to do. Or as you go down the spectrum to the proactive women, they were after every last scare of information they could get. So what do we do with that? How do we come up with a, a, an intervention that satisfies the needs of that whole spectrum? And we turn to shared decision making. Because shared decision making is used in um, a whole lot of healthcare decisions um, outside of immunisation. And it sits at this really nice junction, if you like, between the paternalistic doctor knows best, health, healthcare provider tells me what to do, and the other end of the spectrum, which is the informed choice. We give them the information and we don't make a recommendation. So what does this look like? The first part is an option grid, which is Designed for use during the antenatal consult, this is the draft of the influenza one. It's a single page, it's a tear off sheet with the possible approaches that a lady could take down one axis. So you can see we can have the vaccine while she's pregnant, she can have it just after she's pregnant, which is the cocooning approach, or not have the vaccine at all. And across the top are the risks and the benefits of each of those courses of action, and it's all evidence-based. So we've gone and done the literature review and we've summarised it into the pros and cons of each of those forms of action. So, as I said, it'd be a terror sheet and this would probably suit your more quiescent reactive groups. The other thing we did was on the back of this tear-off sheet, we attempted to cover off some of the information needs that women um, quite often told us about. So there's what are the national recommendations? What's going on elsewhere in the world? What are other women doing? And for those who were really keen, there were references to where we got this information from. So that's the tear-off option grid. The other part of our intervention is the full-blown decision aid. So it's based on the International Patient Decision Aid Standards. It is far more comprehensive and while it's only on paper at the moment, we are planning to have it online. It will have links straight to the published evidence for those who want to go and read the papers. And it also takes into account women's personal values, which is a really important part of decision making, particularly for the proactive group of women. It also has a worksheet so women can go and work their way through the decision in far more detail. So the way it's supposed to work is that a uh, lady comes up for her, her antenatal um, appointment and they can use the tear-off sheet as a discussion guide. And we think that the um, quiescent and reactive women will probably, that would be enough information for them. For the proactive women, there would be a link to the website that they could go away, work through the option grid, uh, sorry, the decision aid in their own time, come back to their next antenatal appointment with their um, worksheet with any, and follow up then with any more um, questions they might have. So the next steps, we're actually currently doing some feasibility testing with the different groups of antenatal care providers in those three groups I mentioned earlier on. We're planning a pilot study in those different settings. And longer term, we'd like to look at making them more, more culturally and linguistically diverse, and also look at meeting the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and their providers as well. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging our collaborators. There are a lot of them. Thank you.